So um, this morning, uh, we're going to talk some more about Doug and Zenji, the founder of our school. And um, I thought uh, I would start by providing a little more context and then a few comments about his return to Japan from 1227 to 1228 and then take us up to his death in 1253. It's really easy to remember how old Dogen was at various times that we're talking about because he was born in 1200, so it's, it's easy. Um, what happened with Sotas and lineage after that is like really super interesting. And shouldn't you talked a little bit about it last week, but we're gonna save that for another time. Um, but I'd like to say a few more words um, about the journey over the sea from Japan to China and how arduous and dangerous it was. Um, I know Shinchu, I mentioned it and Shinchu talked about it, but in doing some review for this, um, this talk, I came across a couple of stories that I want to share with you because I think it it, it provides a little context for what we're talking about here. So there's two monks tales that illustrate this. And the first one that's particularly interesting is uh, that of Saicho, who lived from 767 to 822. Okay, 767 to 822. And Dogen was born in 1200. So he went to China in 804 and returned with the teachings from the Chinese Tiantai school. And that's what became Tendai in Japan. So we've, we've talked a little bit about how powerful, important the Tendai school was. So he established the monastic center on Mount Hiei near Kyoto that Dogen later joined. Saito was much admired and supported by the emperor and the court and his monastery, as we know, became one of the most powerful centers of Buddhist learning in Japan. There's a lot that can be said about Tendai. It's a very complex and rich uh, lineage. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's both the root and was rejected by uh, Dogen, Honen, and Shinran of the Jodo Shin school and Nichiren of the Nichiren school. And there's no denying its importance in Japanese Buddhism. So I think it's interesting that Saito took this journey, this journey that required great dedication and then came back and founded this monastery. And we can imagine how um, the class stratification and politicization that is said to have been present on Mount Hei during Dogen's time impacted and his, his and others' experiences. But I also wonder, I wonder about the traditional stories that get told about this. It was a large community with deep roots and diverse teachings. And um, I'm sure there were many mature monks on Mount Hie. So I wonder how is it that these dedicated young monks could not find what they sought there and needed to leave and discover and develop their own ways. Isn't that interesting? I think it is. I, I had, as I was doing this, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to get them all together? <laughs> to like get, if you could get them all together because they were really like, you know, dug in. Honan, Shinran, Nichiren, and then go back a couple of hundred years and bring in Saito and have them talk about how they started their traditions and what they cared about. And, you know, and then always um, when a tradition is founded, it changes over time, right? So um, Saito made this trip and founded this monastery. He was deeply connected to the emperor and the elite. And it, it grew from there. 
It's also important to know that there were Chinese monks in Japan at the time, missionaries of a sort. Um, they were highly respected and taught widely. And um, one particular monk illustrates the dedication and the unique contribution of these monks. His name was Zhanzhen or Ganjin in Japanese. And at the invitation of a Japanese emissary to China and despite the opposition of his own community, he attempted to go to Japan six times, starting in 743 and finally getting there in 753. These are, he was 55 at his first attempt and 65 in his last attempt. So this a kind of, um, oh, he was also said to be an expert in medicine. And so these attempts in his story which is told in uh, a scroll called The Sea Journey to the East of a great monk from the Tang Dynasty. Okay, so there's a scroll about his travails. On his fifth attempt, he was blown off course and over the course of three years, made his way slowly back along the coast of China to his home. And by the, by the time he arrived back in Yangzhou, he was blind from an infection, okay? Then in 753, this blind monk with companion monks decided to join a Japanese emissary ship and return to Japan. And, and when he, the ship was returning to Japan, so he was going to Japan. They spent three months at sea, three months, and uh, the ship finally returned to Japan. Ganjin got off and was welcomed. He and his monks were welcomed by the emperor. And then he started a monastery in Nara, which is a, if you ever get a chance to go to Japan, go to Nara, it's quite beautiful. And there's these really beautiful old temples there. So he started a center for Buddhism in Japan. And he presided over that until his death 10 years later. So he not only propagated Buddhism, but also Chinese culture to Japan. Really interesting, powerful guy. Can you imagine 55 years old and he, and he tries to go to Japan and finally succeeds by the time he's 65 years old. And then he goes on to found a monastery and teach for 10 years. So he introduced what is known as the Ritsu School of Buddhism in Japan, which focused on the Vinaya, the kind of traditional uh, rules of conduct for monastics, and also, uh, which included celibacy, by the way, and stayed very close to Chinese language and Chinese culture, um, which was considered the kind of touchstone of culture. Um, uh, Ritsu did not survive as a distinct school and was later incorporated in another school, another ancient school, the Shingon school, uh, by a government decree. Um, and today there's only one temple that uh, resisted the government measures and maintained the Ritsu lineage. So there's lots of discussion with scholars about why it didn't continue. But um, most of them agree that it was because it stayed so close to Chinese culture and required fluence, being fluent in Chinese language and really like adapting Chinese culture totally um, that it just didn't draw enough disciples to keep going or fully keep going. So there's lots of other tales about monks making this journey. There's uh, lots of other magical stories about magical tea kettles and the intervention of deities in storms and um, lots of other things. So I just wanna give you one more hit of how um, perilous this journey was and the kind of um, uh, dedication it took to make it. Um, so I think these tales are just as imaginative as the ones that we receive from Europe. 
and indicate our need as humans to embellish on stories and make them fantastical and, you know, like all that. But these Japanese monks and Chinese monks brought Buddhism to the hinterlands of Japan, you know, uh, in the same way that people brought Buddhism here. So getting back to Dogen. Uh, Dogen uh, returned from his time in China. He went to Kenenji, the temple where he practiced before, the Rinzai temple where he practiced before. And um, personally, I think perhaps he wanted to ground himself in a familiar monastic environment and um, absorb and integrate everything that he had learned and, and try and reflect on what was essential for him to teach. And uh, what he wanted to do next. He was also bringing back the effects of his teacher and companion, Yozen, who had died in China. And even though Dogen left Kenenji and differed in Myozen's teachings, he always expressed great respect and gratitude to Myozen throughout his life. So Dogen, said over and over again, as you pointed out last week, that he did not consider what he was doing establishing a new school. He was expressing his understanding of the heart of Buddhist teachings. And he was very clear and passionate about that, sometimes obnoxiously so. So after three years at Kenenji, um, he left. But during that time, a very important monk came and joined him. His name was Kohen Ejo, and he became Dogen's disciple and the abbot of Eheji after Dogen. But one of the things that's interesting is that when Dogen was at Kenenji, Ejo came and asked Dogen to be his student. And Dogen said no, that Ejo should wait until Dogen has founded his own temple. And one of the reasons I think this is interesting is that it indicates to me Dogen's patience in terms of his own development as a teacher and his acknowledgement that the teaching relationship is, does not occur in a vacuum. It's not an abstraction. Community, place, day-to-day -day life are essential. And this is not new to Buddhism. But Dogen has a very particular vision of what this means based on his experience with his teacher, Ru Jing, and his understanding of the teachings and how they are realized in practice. He began writing about this understanding of practice early on. So in 1227, right after he went to Kenenji, he wrote the Fukan Zazengi, Universal Promotion of the Principles of Zazen, universal. And he revised this again twice. He kept coming back to it throughout his life. So this is an adaptation of a Chinese text. But I think one of the reasons it's important is because of the word universal and how important it was to him to keep going back to this over and over again. We chant this every week. We can hear in it um, the combination of attention to bodily deportment, how your physical reality is, how you sit on the cushion, what you do with your tongue, what you do, then what you do with your mind. So it's very physical, very grounded, very much about forms in this life. And also in this is this teachings about what we might call spiritual reality. So that they're never separated, they're always together. And you can see this in his very first teachings. Our body and our mind are not separate. Our way is one of wholeness, not division. And bodily deportment is both a way of realizing that and an expression of that realization. So again, our practice about our lives, through our lives, as our lives. So this is central. This is central to Soto Zen. We pay attention to the details, not in order to be perfect or to get someplace else, someplace special, but because in doing so, we realize who we are. 
and we taste the truth, as we say, of the Tathagata's words. This vital, living, connected reality. So this occurs anywhere at any time. And we come to know this by putting ourselves in situations in which particularity is described and followed, both fluid and flexible and very specific. We see this uh, emphasis take shape too, in a very interesting way in the importance Dogen placed on the way a monastic complex is built. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about that either later. So in 1230, Dogen left Kenenji in Kyoto. He wandered around a bit, uh, apparently sp spent some time in a small temple outside Kyoto and students started coming to him. Uh, as Shinchu mentioned, he had men and women students and nuns as well as monks. He strongly supported women as fully able practitioners, a uh, difference from many teachers at the time, and um, taught that women uh, were not impure. Some In some uh, many traditions, the idea is that women are impure. There's something called the Blood Bowl Sutra that's about this, which is really interesting. And um, enlightenment required being reborn into a male body. So this is common thinking at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a really interesting history about how this understanding got grafted into a pre-existing Japanese culture, which did not have that ethos. Uh, but another time, perhaps. So he wrote, Dogen wrote in no uncertain time terms, particularly later on in 1240, when he wrote this uh, fascicle, Rahai Tokuzui, that women, women were fully able to realize the way and to think other was, was not, a, not only stupid and foolish, and he's, he's like really like out there in the way he says this, but he says it's in direct um, opposition to the central teachings of Buddhism. So he also wrote during this time Ben Dawa, uh, a talk on pursuing the way, which is a very clear and straightforward text, and um, began to write the essays that become the Shobogenzo, the true Dharma Eye. So he was creative, sometimes audacious, sometimes confrontational in his teachings and writing, and he seemed committed to making his vision of Buddhist teachings and practice available to all people during this time. So in 1233, at the age of 33, he founded a monastic center called Kanondori, which was then expanded to, to be Koshoji. It was the first center built in the style that he experienced in China. And he was joined there by other monks one of them, Jacqueline, who he had known in China, Chinese monk. And um, as Shinchu mentioned last week, uh, monks from a school called the Daruma School. So this was a complex community. And his teachings reflect the, the complexity of who he was responding to. The types and arrangements of the building at Koshoji concretely express Dogen's experience and vision of practice. So for example, there's now a monk's hall in which the monks sit, sit together and they also sleep there. And there's a Dharma hall in which former talks are given. So the centrality of seated meditation and teachings in seamless communal life are central here. And it's expressed in the fact that there's buildings that are dedicated to this. He also expressed a deep respect for the position of the cook and for work and for caring for the physical plant, for the buildings and the grounds and all the other aspects of life. Very embodied, very concrete. He wrote extensively during this time, central essays like the Genjo Koan, Tenzu Kyokun, which is part of uh, his writings on, on the Shingi, which is a monastic community. Um, how the practice of a monastic community happens, 
um, these were gathered together and um, they're still in use to this day. In 1240, uh, by 1240, he'd uh, written the majority of the essays in the Shobogenzo. And at this time, Ejo, his disciple Ejo, was also compiled talks of um, Dogen's into the Zui Monkey. That's a very accessible guide and lots of fun to explore. So the community continued ex continue to expand and donors came and there was a lot, lot happening. It was really good. Um, and then in 1243 or 1244, with the support of a, a new patron, Dokin decided to leave it all and move his community to a property that this new patron was giving him in Ichizen, in the mountains of the far north. Koshoji was thriving, so it's unclear. Why would he move? And there's lots of speculation about this. Some think contributing factors were Dogen's loss of support from the powerful Fujiwara clan. If you remember from an earlier talk, this was his mother's family, the elite family. Other proposed reasons are difficulties with other sects, including Rinzai, his growing popularity, problems with competing patrons. So Kyoto was a hotbed of competing factions and power struggles. It's not hard to imagine why he might want to leave all that behind, but it was a pretty dramatic move. He was not exiled as Honen and Shinran were, but I think maybe he was facing the same prospect. The Sotoshu says that he was following the injunction of his teacher, Ru Jing, to not live in crowds and cities, but go to the mountain, receive few people, and continue the true teaching. Likely to my mind, uh, there were a number of reasons. Conflict in Kyoto, the desire to be in the mountains, following his teacher's advice, his own sense of what was best for him and his community, to be a part, to be deeply immersed in nature. He was 43 and vigorous, but he had also been writing and teaching and building at a furious pace. Ichizen is in the mountains. It's 80 miles from Kyoto, two days by carriage at the time. Um, so a major undertaking just to get there. And if you go there now, you get a sense still of how remote it is. Dogen is said to have spent the first year in the mountains at a small temple called Kipoji, while his patron and lay followers built the new monastery. So Kim writes, Dogen secluded from the world by heavy snow preached and worked as energetically as ever and produced 29 chapters of the Shobogenzo. He was unquestionably still at the height of his literary production. The monastery was opened in 1244, named Daibutsuji, Great Buddha Temple, and two years later, renamed Eheji. So this move both shifts and expresses Dogen's key aim. It is an elite place. Few can get there. It's not open to lay people to come to train. Many say there is no historical record of women practicing at Eheji. And I think it's fair to say that if there were, they were extraordinary women. So how do we reconcile this? his desire to spread the Dharma all over and um, his retreat to the mountains to uh, teach an elite crew, mostly of men. I want to mention that Tigan Leighton notes that one of the women ancestors we honor in the recitation of the lineage, Egi, Egi, was ordained as a Daruma in the Daruma school as a nun, but became Dogen's disciple. And Tigan says, she has she is said to have spent more than 20 years with him, um, practiced with him at Eheji, and attended his sickbed. Mm -hmm. She was also helped Cohen Ajo in the uh, transition following Dogen's death. And there's some thought that she helped uh, to record the show of Bogenzo's Wee Monkey, the collection of his talks. We really don't know. 
But we do know that AHG was not set up as a place for women or lay people to practice alongside the monks. So how do we think about this? You know, I think about Dogen making a careful, well-considered choice, a hard choice, perhaps. I think this choice mirrors the choices we make in our own lives. What do we prioritize? How do we honor what we've been given? How do we honor the Dharma and realize the way? We can't, we can withdraw to the mountains, but we can't do that and actively serve many people day to day in concrete ways, right? This was a really big question for me when I went to Tassajara to practice. Um, how can I? How can I abandon? How can I go up to the mountains? I'm not saying I'm a Dogen Sanji, but I am saying we face these kinds of questions in our life. I resolved it by putting my faith in the practice um, and trust that it was doing some good, maybe in a way that I couldn't even see and follow my heart to what I felt was the best for, way for me at the time. We can also think of this in terms of our day-to-day -day life. What do you do with your time and your life? There's no one way. So what's yours? You know, I ask this a lot of you. So we can also think of this in terms of the impact uh, the physical environment has on our practice. So. We come here, the altar, the community sitting together, um, the smell of the place, the feel of the place, the sound of the bells. This is a physical event. And we can question how, when, and if we remove our, ourselves from the hustle and bustle of our daily life. How do we move ourselves to silence? Not as an escape, but as an expression of what is most intimate. The people who went to study with Dogen at Aheji went not, this is really important, went not just to study with him, but to follow a way of practice that he was devoted to with him. So it's not a personality cult. It, it was an invitation to join him in making real a way of living and practicing together. This is essential in understanding Dogen and Dogen Zenji's teachings and practice. Dogen is not in it for himself. He was in it for the Dharma. And each person who came had the opportunity to discover the way for themselves with him. It also tells us that Dogen was willing to absent himself from fame and gain. So during this time, he continued to write and edit his writings, much of them on the importance of monastic practice and forms. And um, so this was, a, again, a very fruitful time focused on this community. And then in 1247, he was invited um, to go to Kamakura. And as you recall, Kamakura was the center of the shogunate power. He was invited by the shogun, Hojo Tokiyori, who was the military head and therefore de facto the head of Japan. At the urging of his patron, Dogen accepted this invitation and he went to Kamakura for six months, gave talks, uh, presented the precepts, gave the precepts to the shogun. And in the end, and he was offered a position of power, an uh, abbot of a new monastery, but he rejected that and returned to AHG. So one of the things that some scholars point out, which I think is pretty interesting, is that after he returned to AHG, much of uh, the focus of his teachings, more of it, was on causality and ethical implications. So we can imagine the impact of being in the orbit of a person who by all accounts caused much violence and suffering and the thinking was, was struggling with, to reconcile his acts with his own humanity. And he was in the midst of one of the, one of the key centers of power and political struggle. 
So lots of people have different feelings about the meaning of this visit, but it's just important to remember that it happened and that he returned to Ahechi and remained there, continuing to write and lead his community. Another focus of his writing at this time was clarifying the practice for young monks. And again, there's a, a lot of debate about this writings, but it seems to me that Dogen was preparing the community for when he was no longer there. In 1250, Dogen accepted the imperial robe, something that he had been rejecting for a long time. And um, it's a sign of his connection with power and the government. And um, in 1252, at 52, his health began to fail. He gave his robes to Cohen Ejo and made Ejo the abbot of Meiji. And in 1253, he went with Ejo to Kyoto for medical treatment, which did not help. He died at the home of a lay supporter in Kyoto uh, in 1253. And he's said to have died in Zazen posture. And his coffin was taken to Keninji and he was cremated there. And there was a simple funeral, perhaps because he died uh, so far away from Eheji. Um, I've also heard it said that uh, central to his final days was the practice of taking refuge. Dogen's ashes, ashes are at Eheji. And, um, you know, Shinchu and I each did um, a series of ceremonies um, what, that are called Zuise. And they're, um, they mark the transition into taking your place as a teacher within the Soto, the Japanese Soto Shu. So you go and you do a number of ceremonies over the co course of a few days. And as a part of that, you climb up these very narrow stairs, narrow in the sense of depth, you just have to go up sideways, like these very narrow stairs up to a place where you bow to the ashes of Dogen Senji. It's very moving. It's very powerful. Yeah. And um, you only get to do it once in your life. You can't go back and do it again. So um, his ashes are there at Eheji. His practice is there and alive after all these years. Um, the community is strong, the training is strong, and it's extraordinarily beautiful place. So it's also interesting to note, um, considering the impact of Dogen's writing on Buddhism in North America and on us, um, that except for a small number of specialized scholars, his writings were basically unknown into the wider world for several centuries from a generation or two after his death until the 1920s. So I don't know all the details of this, but I do know that there was this revival and this interest and some of his uh, work was actually rediscovered. But um, his impact was seamlessly continued in the practice, in his disciples, in his disciples' disciples, all the way down to us for his style of training, for his inclusion of the precepts, for his strong vision about the possibility of realization for everyone. And also um, his teachings became the foundation for the dissemination of Soto Zen practice by Keizan Zenji, one of the of fourth generation from Dogen. So, we inher inherited all of this, and um, I think we can be deeply grateful to our founder. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.